Okay, so it's my very great pleasure um, to welcome you to this CIPL seminar uh, and particularly to welcome our speaker, Christopher Knight from 11 Kings Bench Walk, um, very well known in information law and data protection um, circles. Uh, very much, I think, a bridge between um, the academic world so, uh, has written a lot in, in, in an academic context, but very much also uh, and primarily a practitioner. In fact, going through um, his cases today, uh, preparing for this, it, it, it's incredible what cases, um, Chris, you've been involved in. Um, the Schrems case and, 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 and Facebook uh, recent litigation, uh, the privacy international litigation, these both in the Court of Justice, some very interesting tribunal cases, including one involving leave.eu and Eldon Insurance and various uh, marketing, or were they, and uh, messages to do with the um, Brexit uh, referendum. Um, and also another very interesting one, which has only uh, recently been published um, through uh, Vision Productions, um, which I think you're probably going to be focusing on to some extent in your talk itself, which is going to look um, at the ever interesting, I think, topic, which is how data protection and protecting personal information intersects with freedom of expression and whether we really have a coherent uh, 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 system for uh, engaging with that fundamental, sometimes synergy, but very much more often um, tension um, uh, 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 in so many of the cases and in, in so much of life. Okay. Um, so uh, you can, by the way, submit any um, questions and answers, que well, no, not the answers maybe, but the questions uh, as you want. Um, the, the, the answers, time... submit the answers. <laughs> you can try on the answers as well. I and mean, we do want a real discussion uh, in this, um, mm -hmm. but we'll let Christopher uh, go first in terms of the answers and uh, over to him. Thank you very much. David, um, and just for your note, those of you who are interested in the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, the Leave.eu uh, appeal decision came out from the Upper Tribunal just a couple of days ago, um, upholding the First Tier Tribunal in all respects. Um, but good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this excellent series of webinars. Um, this centre didn't exist when I started as an undergraduate in Cambridge, which now feels uh, a lifetime ago. And I don't think anyone taught data protection law um, for reasons which remain slightly unclear to me. I now uh, practice quite heavily in data protection law and have begun to, um, and indeed began to do so before the GDPR was even a twinkle in the milkman's eye. Um, and I'm now basking in the sudden public awareness of the existence and importance of data protection law. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure data protection law has ever uh, been sexy, but I did do a pub quiz in 2018 to which the answer to one question was the GDPR, and that would have been unthinkable just a few years earlier. Um, freedom of expression has, however, a much more venerable history and a considerably higher degree of public and legal awareness and understanding. It's a convention right and a common law right with an extensive body of jurisprudence. In contrast, data protection is not a convention right, although there are increasing aspects of it in the treatment of the Article 8 case law. See in particular CAT in the UK and Gochran in the UK uh, recently, and it most certainly is not a common law right. But how one balances freedom of expression concerns with data protection issues is a vexed question and which seems to me at least has been the subject of relatively limited direct case law. And I wanted in this seminar to discuss that limited case law, or at least some of it in the time, and consider whether and to what extent the law is able to balance free expression rights with data protection rights and obligations. Article 9 of the 1995 Data Protection Directive contained the sole nod to freedom of expression rights. It provided that member states shall provide for exemptions or derogations from the provisions of this directive for the processing of personal data carried out solely for journalistic purposes or the purpose of artistic or literary expression only if they are necessary to reconcile the right to privacy with the rules governing freedom of expression. Much the same appears in Article 85 of the GDPR. Member states shall by law reconcile the right to the protection of personal data pursuant to this regulation 
with the right to freedom of expression and information, including processing for journalistic purposes and the purposes of academic, artistic or literary expression. Uh, and then in 85.2, for processing carried out for journalistic purposes or the purpose of, our, uh, of the other um, special purposes, member states shall provide for exemptions or derogations if they are necessary to reconcile the right to the protection of personal data with the freedom of expression and information. Note the addition of and information there. But that is on any view in both forums, a somewhat hands-off approach in a legislative scheme, which is otherwise extremely prescriptive. Uh, the concept of journalism in EU law is a broad one, just as it is under the convention. It extends beyond the activities of media undertakings and encompasses other activities, the object of which uh, is the disclosure to the public of information, opinions and ideas. See, for example, uh, the Finnish Satakunan case in the Court of Justice. That case and a second uh, is one of two main Court of Justice decisions on um, the role of freedom of expression in the data protection context. And it's the second one I want to focus on. Uh, the second case is the Buovitz case, um, in which the Court of Justice indicated that a Latvian man who had filmed police officers taking a statement in a police station and uploaded it to YouTube to draw attention to alleged malpractice could fall within Article 9 of the Directive if the sole purpose of doing so was for the disclosure to the public of information, opinions or ideas. Citizen bloggers, citizen journalists, citizen YouTubers potentially protected. We know, of course, that the concept is not unlimited. Google, Google failed to convince Mr Justice Warby, uh, as he then was, in the Right to be Forgotten case of NT1, that their publication of search results to third party articles uh, was processing for solely for the purposes of journalism and that was always an ambitious argument. But the real crux of the issue I want to focus on comes a few paragraphs later in the Boo of its judgment, at paragraphs 63 to 66. There, the Court of Justice emphasised that in order to achieve a balance between those two fundamental rights, the protection of the fundamental right to privacy requires that the derogations and limitations in relation to the protection of personal data must apply only insofar as is strictly necessary. More or less what the directive says with a slight gloss, particularly with a reference to strictly necessary. In other words, national freedom of expression exemptions and derogations must not be interpreted and applied so as to undermine the very purpose of the directive to protect the privacy and personal data rights of data subjects. And that seems to me to be crucially important because it's a very different approach on its face to that established in the case law considering the balance to be struck between articles 8 and 10 of the convention. Uh, in the usual context of media publications about uh, private matters, it's been long held that neither article has in principle priority over the other. What is required is a fact sensitive balancing exercise see classically Lord Stain's judgment in re -S. But that lack of priority is decidedly not the language uh, of the court in Burvids. Uh, the data protection regime is to protect personal data and any derogation from that it is to be limited and must be strictly necessary. There's little sense of moral equivalence in the reasoning. Uh, in Axel Springer and Germany, uh, the Grand Chamber of the Court of Human Rights famously identified a number of criteria that must be considered when balancing the relevant Article 10 and 8 rights in a case where the disputed information has been published, uh, and most of those transposed to a pre-publication context too. The Court of Justice read those criteria across in paragraph 66 of Boovids, where it cited them and set them out with approval. But, and this is a significant but, uh, indeed a Kardashian sized but, the CJU added at the end of that list, similarly, the possibility for the controller to adopt measures to mitigate the extent of the interference with the right to privacy must be taken into account. Now, why is that problematic? It's problematic, it seems to me, because it is fundamentally contrary to an important aspect of the Article 10 case law, uh, namely, that it is not for the courts to substitute their views uh, for those of the press as to what techniques of reporting should be adopted in a particular case. Article 10 uh, protects not just the content of what is, but also 
the form in which it is said. Pope says in ReBBC at paragraph 25, courts are not editors. But if to consider whether a journalistic exemption is applied only so far as strictly necessary, one must consider whether they could uh, have mitigated the extent of the interference, then that does sound a lot like placing the courts in the editor's chair in the name of data protection rights. Uh, it's a reversal of the focus on the very substantial degree of protection given to journalistic expression and editorial decision making under Article 10 of the Convention by requiring close scrutiny uh, of the privacy proportionality of those decisions and of their alternatives, emphasis added, uh, without, without, one must add, uh, any indication from the Court of Justice that it is aware that it's doing anything problematic or potentially novel. Uh, some of those issues were ventilated, but uh, by no means all decided uh, in the recent uh, uh, decision that David mentioned uh, at the outset, and many of you won't have read, uh, because it's a decision of the first tier tribunal uh, information rights only. It's a case in which I acted for the Information Commissioner, and it's worth taking through in a little detail. It was an appeal against a monetary penalty notice issued under the 1998 Act in the sum of £120,000. And what's unusual about this notice is that it was not the usual data loss incident with which almost all MPNs uh, have been concerned. This was about the filming of a documentary on stillbirth by a very reputable TV production company called True Vision Productions. If you've ever watched a Stacey Dooley documentary, you've probably seen something they produced, for example. TVP wanted to make a documentary about stillbirths to raise awareness of its risks uh, and the traumatic experience mothers have to go through when uh, in, a very, in a small but significant number of cases they find that their baby is stillborn and in particular they, they have to give birth to, which is often not something that's understood. And one of the strands of the documentary they wanted to have was to capture the moment a stillbirth was diagnosed by a clinician. They wanted to capture what TVP had been told by clinicians was a, a primal, primal guttural groan of despair on the part uh, of the mother. Uh, what they had done to try and achieve this was to place fixed CCTV cameras in the examination rooms of a clinic in Adam Brooks Hospital down the road from many of you, uh, which was where pregnant women went if worried about a decrease in movement of their unborn child in their third trimester in particular. TVP had worked with the trust on the plan and on some of the details. Uh, the cameras were to be running constantly uh, as well as sound recording, uh, but the footage would only be accessed if the diagnosis had occurred and, and if the woman involved agreed to it. She'd need to agree again later uh, at a later stage for the footage to be used in the broadcast. Patients attending the clinic were not told directly that the cameras were there or precisely what they were doing, uh, but there were some notices up on the walls and generic letters on tables. If a patient noticed these and raised a concern, there was one room without a camera, which might or might not be free. The cameras could not be turned off, uh, even if it was felt clinically necessary to do so to avoid distress to the patient. Indeed, uh, when adverse news coverage broke uh, about the filming, the clinic's own nurses had to cover the cameras with plastic bags to obscure them and to prevent footage being taken uh, until the documentary team could arrive to remove them. Uh, by that time, uh, in fact, no footage of a diagnosis had been captured. And in the end, the documentary was broadcast on Channel 4 to wide acclaim as sweet ch as child of mine uh, without any diagnosis footage, but lots of other content obtained using handheld cameras filming patients dealing or having dealt with uh, a stillbirth. The Information Commissioner issued a monetary penalty notice in the sum of £120,000 for breach of the first data protection principle finding that the way TVP had gone about the processing of the unquestionably sensitive personal data of the thousands of women filmed was unfair, was contrary to their privacy rights and therefore unlawful, and did not meet a condition in either Schedules 2 or 3 to the 1998 Act. TVP argued that the special purposes exemption in Section 32 applied, so they didn't have to comply with the first data protection principle in any extent to which they had failed to do so. And it was certainly common ground uh, that they could not rely uh, on a condition in Schedule 3. 
and relied needed to rely on section 32 at least to that extent. They also argued that imposing a penalty at all was an infringement of their Article 10 rights as journalists, and there were various other arguments about whether the conditions for the imposition of the penalty were met. It's worth pausing here to note Section 32 uh, of the 1998 Act, which, uh, as an exemption, is retained in very similar form in paragraph 26 of Schedule 2 to the 2018 Data Protection Act. Both implement uh, Article 9 of the Directive and Article 85 of the GDPR, respectively. Section 32.1 provided that personal data which are processed only for the special purposes, uh, i.e. journalistic processing in this context, are exempt uh, from any provision to which this subsection relates, which includes the first data protection principle, if A, the processing is undertaken with a view to the publication by any person of any journalistic, literary or artistic material, uh, B, the data controller reasonably believes that, having regard in particular to the special importance of the public interest in freedom of expression, publication would be in the public interest, uh, and C, the data controller reasonably believes that in all the circumstances, compliance with that provision is incompatible with the special purposes. Mr Justice Warby explained in NT1 and Google uh, that each of section 32.1b and c has a subjective and an objective element. The controller must establish that it held a belief that publication would be in the public interest and that this belief was objectively reasonable. Uh, for C, it must establish a subjective belief that compliance with the provision from which it sought exemption would be incompatible with the special purpose in question, and that this was an objectively reasonable belief. Uh, and that seems to me must be right. The tribunal dismissed TVP's appeal, uh, although um, the, the commissioner agreed at the hearing that because of the impact of the pandemic in particular, the fine should be heavily reduced to £20,000. I won't comment too much on the reasoning of the tribunal, not least because I may well have to defend it uh, on an appeal, but the case as a whole is an interesting cauldron of some of those tensions between freedom of expression principles derived from the Article 10 case law, on which TVP heavily relied, and the primacy given in data protection law to the protection of privacy interests, uh, which the Commissioner emphasised. The recalibration of that balance away from the protective instincts of Axel Springer and that line of authority can be seen in the tribunal's decision that it was not objectively reasonable for TVP to believe that the best way to produce their documentary was by the use of fixed CCTV cameras running at all times with no off button and about which pa patients were not specifically informed in a transparent way. They should, thought the tribunal, have used handheld cameras as they had in the rest of the documentary so that data subject understanding would have been clear. TVP had not processed the data fairly, particularly in the sense of transparently, and it was reasonably possible for it to have done so. The tribunal's judgment doesn't expressly engage with the courts are not editors line of authority, which was raised before it. But it's hard not to see the decision as a rejection of that stricture in the context of data protection law. Nothing in the directive or the GDPR says that journalists are to be absolutely exempt from compliance. It can't be right that no journalist could ever be the subject of a monetary penalty. Uh, and we know uh, from the Levson inquiry what can happen if media organisations that believe that they're effectively immune from a significant area uh, of individual rights, including specifically data protection rights. And yet in other respects, the domestic implementation of the freedom of expression exemptions is very generous to those engaged in the special purposes, uh, including uh, for the purpose of journalism. The stay mechanism contained in section 32.4 uh, is a notorious example. That imposed an automatic stay on all proceedings uh, for breach of the DPA uh, against journalists where the processing uh, in question was only for the purposes of journalism and was with a view to publication. The Court of Appeal in Stunt and Associated Newspapers unanimously construed that to mean that post-publication the stay did not apply, uh, holding that a wider interpretation would be incompatible with the directive. But they split as to whether such a blanket rule, even so interpreted, uh, which could only be lifted following a determination from the Commissioner that in effect the conditions weren't in fact met, was a legitimate interpretation of the directive, or whether it had tipped the balance too far in favour of journalists 
providing a de facto pre-publication immunity from data protection enforcement. Uh, by two to one, the Court of Appeal found the same mechanism was compatible with EU law, but the arguments are clearly finally balanced and they referred it to the Court of Justice. Unfortunately, that reference was withdrawn following the bankruptcy of Mr Stunt. The UK government had intervened, uh, making forceful submissions about the importance of free expression rights uh, and uh, to those rights of preventing pre-publication interference, potentially stymieing or having a chilling effect on public interest stories and investigations. See, for example, Mosley in the UK in Strasbourg. And it's fair to say that the questions communicated to the parties before the oral hearing from the Court of Justice Um, gave the strong impressions, asking pointed questions about whether similar restrictions apply to privacy and harassment claims, which of course they do not. Um, the Court of Justice questions didn't necessarily accept an, an acceptance, indicate an acceptance of the proposition that data protection law is different, uh, perhaps because, for example, of its very wide application and lack uh, of any uh, equivalent to a triviality threshold or a reasonable expectation of privacy test. The issue is likely to arise again because a very similar mechanism is now in place in section 176 of the 2018 Act. Determinations of the ICO can be appealed to the tribunal, uh, but that's a slow moving and long winded series of hurdles to claims being brought before the courts. And only one such appeal has ever been purportedly brought, uh, and that was withdrawn after it was pointed out by the commissioner that they, it had not in fact been a special purposes determination at all. It, in one important respect, particularly highlighted by TVP in their appeal, the 2018 Act increases the protection to journalistic controllers. Uh, it provides that the commissioner may not issue an information notice or enforcement notice or penalty notice with respect to the processing of personal data for the special purposes unless a section 100 unless a determination has been made under section 174 uh, that in effect the stay mechanism provisions do not apply uh, see sections 143 1 152 1 and 156 1 respectively and in the context of the enforcement and penalty notice provisions the commissioner must obtain the approval of the court uh, before issuing one uh, against uh, a journalistic controller uh, it is for that reason unlikely that the tvp penalty notice could occur again uh, under the gdpr and the 2018 act in my view, there's been a legislative and policy failure properly to address the critical interplay between freedom of expression rights and data protection rights under the EU regime and the UK's implementation of it. There are very difficult balancing exercises to be struck, not least because personal data will often fall well short of the sort of private information protected by a misuse of private information claim or by Article 8 of the Convention. But there's little indication, not least because of a lack of direction at the EU legislative level, as to whether the data protection regime is intended to fundamentally recalibrate the balancing exercise struck by the Convention, uh, how it is meant to do so, uh, and in what circumstances, uh, and whether the protections afforded to public interest journalism under the Article 10 jurisprudence are simply to be uh, pared down or, or dispensed with altogether. A well-known example of um, European EU silence on uh, freedom of expression issues is the right to be forgotten case, or at least its first iteration. The CJEU's decision in Google Spain is notorious for its total failure to recognise any freedom of expression interests which might be involved in delisting requests. Those interests are, with respect, obvious. Uh, they are not so much Google's interests necessarily, but those of third parties to whom search results link and which may often be journalistic products uh, and uh, interests of the public whose article 10 rights include the receipt of the information they are interested in. in in the more recent case of gc and the CNIL, the french equivalent of the information commissioner the court of justice sought to correct that course somewhat uh, accepting that paragraph 57, by reference to the more expressed text of Article 17 of the GDPR, that um, the circumstance that Article 17.3 of the GDPR now expressly provides that the 
data subjects' rights to erasure is excluded where the processing is necessary for the exercise of the right of information guaranteed by Article 11 of the Charter is an expression of the fact that the right to protection of personal data is not an absolute right, uh, but as Recital 4 of the regulation states, must be considered in relation to its function in society and be balanced against other fundamental rights in accordance with the principle of proportionality. Uh, in the usual incoherent and incomprehensible language of the Court of Justice, uh, that is a bit of a mea culpa. The Court of Justice went on to recognise that even in the context of the publication of special category data and criminal conviction data, a balance had to be struck between uh, the right to erasure of historic material uh, and the freedom of information of internet users. Note that language of freedom of information of internet users picked up uh, from um, Article 85 UPR, potentially interested in accessing that particular web page by means of such a search. Even that, or even that recognition in GC, though, contained a caveat that search engines were still required, even if they've refused to delist, uh, to reorder their search results to better show the current legal position. Uh, and what that seems to mean is that uh, if, for example, an article, about a, an article about a successful appeal should appear higher in the search results than an article about the original conviction, uh, not a great deal of consideration given by the court to the wide array of circumstances in which the right uh, to erase or the right to be forgotten might apply that go well beyond uh, commercial and extremely well-resourced search engines. Uh, for example, um, uh, I've, I, I have in the past had to advise clients who uh, operate databases, um, or including legal databases, legal research databases, or due diligence databases, about how the right to be forgotten might apply in their context, um, and where it is uh, not a publicly accessible uh, source, but uh, it is a sort of mini database on, along search engine lines. The court's approach has its problems in GC, undoubtedly, but it's a welcome indication that the Court of Justice tacitly recognised the criticisms of the apparent absolutism of Google Spain and were prepared to adjust course to reflect more expressly the need to balance competing rights and interests. Uh, the NT1 decision mentioned in the High Court here had sought to carry out that course correction more expressly, holding that the balancing exercise mandated uh, was to be done with the scales empty uh, and that the Court of Justice had not prescribed anything else in Google Spain uh, that were contrary to the classical um, Article 8, Article 10 balancing exercise that the Court was familiar with from the Convention context. Let's see paragraphs 132 to 133 in particular. Uh, and the, the, the subsequent decision in GC probably means that that approach uh, is unlikely to be materially altered. But it remains unsatisfactory that guidance on these difficult questions of balancing have to be dragged from the CJAU and that here, as in other areas, there's been an unwillingness to properly confront and grapple with the apparent different priorities of the case law of the Strasbourg Court on the one hand uh, and the Luxembourg Court on the other. Uh, and to give one uh, example from experience um, <clears throat> of those different approaches, in the context of the, the Privacy International line of case law, and indeed the Schrems II line of case law, um, the Court of Justice is supremely uninterested, um, despite member states repeatedly referring to it, supremely uninterested in the approach of the Strasbourg Court to questions of national security and the wide margin of appreciation that the Strasbourg Court tends to afford um, to uh, Article 8 rights in the national security context, the CJU um, thinks uh, that that balance uh, needs to be struck in a very different way by it. Uh, that, that comes out very clearly from the questions and the approach of the court in oral session. Uh, it's much more reluctant to pin its colours to the mast and say so directly in its judgments. And that provide, that um, that is a degree of opacity which is unhelpful uh, and causes problems, uh, particularly for domestic courts attempting to reconcile different strands uh, of approach uh, and fundamentally different policy priorities.
Uh, there are potentially good reasons of legal policy why, in the context of a legislative scheme intended to protect personal data rights of all data subjects, uh, a different approach might, must be taken from the high watermark of the Article 10 case law. In particular, uh, it's important to recognise that data protection law across a, uh, applies across a much wider array of contexts than the typical Article 810 balancing exercise has tended to arise in. Uh, the data protection complaints are not usually about publications in newspapers, although as per stunt, they sometimes are. Uh, one practical example of how data protection law can be used as a weapon in private party litigation uh, it could, uh, could be found in the recent Avon and Orbis decision of Mr Justice Warby, which concerned certain parts of the notorious Trump dossier produced by uh, the former uh, SIS operative Christopher Steele. Three Russian businessmen objected to how they were described in the dossier, which was perhaps not entirely surprisingly uh, not to remark upon their renowned integrity. Uh, the judgment deals with a lot of data protection issues and is an extremely interesting uh, read, but for present purposes, it's most uh, useful to note the complaint of, uh, that the complaint of breach of the accuracy principle was allowed in substance to be run and determined in a manner very much akin to defamation law. Now, that's, that was not a wholly new development. Mr Justice Warby had emphasised the read across between accuracy and defamation in the context of complaints of inaccurate data processing in NT1 and Google. Uh, in Avon, uh, an Orbis will be applied across uh, defamation principles to discern between facts and opinions on the basis that they reflected uh, the experience of generations, I think was his language. There was, for example, reference to uh, the chase level of meanings, uh, which is very much a, a defamation uh, concept. There was also extensive cross-examination uh, of witnesses about um, how they went about uh, reaching the conclusions and expressing the conclusions that they did in the dossier. There was not, however, any particular discussion of freedom of expression concerns, uh, and perhaps there needs to be, because again, the accuracy principle can be engaged in an array of contexts in which defamation law may not be able to be and or without some of the procedural protections against claims uh, afforded by the Defamation Act, uh, including the various uh, thresholds and hurdles that are imposed by the Defamation Act, uh, and the practical point uh, that all controllers are potentially at risk in relation to any data uh, processed by them, not just journalists, uh, and that your data protection GDPR action can be brought in the county courts as a small claim, which have no jurisdiction over defamation actions, uh, where the irrecoverable cost of defending may mean that settlement, unwarranted settlements uh, are more likely. All of this has a potential free expression impact, at least as a chilling effect, which the legislative framework doesn't address and which the jurisprudence hasn't really considered, uh, but which proceeds on the basis that rights in the data protection principles are, are imperative. Uh, ultimately, it seems to me that balances are there to be found uh, and may be being slowly worked through, uh, but the present state of the law leaves much uh, in a practical void. There has been uh, insufficient focus in the minds of legislators and in courts uh, on how to reevaluate the array of data protection tools and their intersection with freedom of expression rights. Uh, and what are the competing priorities uh, and the policy uh, ju judgments and justifications that need to be made in making those selections, uh, including outside the limited category of permitted protections uh, for processing uh, of the purposes of journalism, art, literature uh, and academia. Uh, there is, it seems to me, much more work uh, and more thinking uh, to be done. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Christopher, for, uh, for a, a really rich and interesting um, presentation. It's incredible all, all the issues which I've been noting down and, and you've got through uh, during, during that. Um, so uh, the uh, questions are very much open. Um,